Hey guys, I'm Better Together. We have Allison Stoner. You may know her from her days on the Disney Channel or her work in music videos like Missy Elliott's work. But today we're talking all about how she says, normal life is so much better than famous life in not the exact words, but you'll get to hear it from her mouth on the show and how she completely changed her life and had this metamorphosis and is now following her, her calling, I believe, Allison. Is this true? I would say there is a lot of purpose and a lot of intention and thankfully a lot more health and wholeness going into my day to day. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. And don't forget to subscribe, everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we try to do here every single day. We try at least. I think we do. I think we do. You're right. We yeah. really do. Heck yeah. And listen, I'm high-fiving the shit out of myself all the time, so <laughs> that's helping. Me too. I love you, Maria. Whoever thought I'd say that? What? <laughs> high-fiving, yoga nidra-ing, all Oh my things. God. I haven't yoga nidra in a couple of days <gasps> because of my travels and stuff. You got to get back um, on it. But you know what I do sometimes hmm. is I will yoga nidra in my head. Oh. Like if I'm... If I know I'm too tired to like shut the YouTube off after and not be startled by the noise after, yes, yes. then I will just yoga nidra in my head and I'll just pretend I'm her. It's like, touch your thumb, your right <laughs> thumb, your index finger, middle finger, ring finger, little finger. <laughs> I like how she says little finger. Little. Maybe you should record your own. I know. For all of us. I can. All well, right. I actually should because... The one I want is to have the music just keep going yes. for like eight hours. Yes. So we would edit music at the end so that you could just have this like joyful, restful sleep. We actually should do that. Yeah, we Because could. I mean, I YouTube that stuff all the time. I always am looking for the ones that the music, like you said, doesn't stop. My question is, is how do you do it with integrity where you're not just copying somebody else's words? Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I'm not somebody who knows Yoga Nidra to be like, you know. Yeah. I'm going to give you my practice. <laughs> I guess like there must be like public domain ones you can like probably use like music. Yeah, I'm sure there are. So we should look into that because okay. I really will. We can talk to Yogini too. Do you think it'll be weird to hear myself, Yoga Nidra me? <laughs> you know what I actually think we should do? Side note is we should get you on the Calm app because there's a lot of people on the Calm app who do their little readings. Mm. So that could be something to look into. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well... I've been told I have an interesting voice, so... There you go. Not interesting. Calming voice. <laughs> Calming. You do. Um, all right, our quote of the day, seek first to understand before expecting to be understood. That is by Dr. Stephen R. Covey, and he is our guest, Allison Stoner's favorite quote, which is such a good quote. Seek first to understand before expecting to be understood. Ooh, that is so good. So good. All right, Hill Squad, uh, welcome back. And uh, thanks for being with us. As always, we are going to be chatting with Allison Stoner today about mental health, the mind-body connection, and her journey navigating the entertainment industry as a child star, being forced later in life to prioritize her mental health and her now advocating for improved mental health resources. So... Basically, in a nutshell, she went through the ringer, came out the other side, and is doing basically what I'm doing is trying to help people with all of the findings. Yep. Correct? Correct. Correct. Very correct. Uh, Allison Stoner, if you don't recall, just recently was invited back to perform. Was it the VMAs? VMAs, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Missy Elliott did her, um, her thing on the VMAs, and... They they did a throwback to when Allison was a child star, a little dancer in the video. So there she is, like break dancing and stuff in the work video. And it was so cute back then to see these little girls like dancing with her. And they had her, and she was kind of like the lead one. And they had her come back as an adult and do it. And she killed it. I remember her killing it and being like, whoa, that was so cool. And uh, and so today she's going to be with us on the show, which is exciting. 
I'm so excited. I remember watching that music video because I kind of grew up with her on Disney Channel. We're the same age. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that she was so cool, especially in Cheaper by the Dozen. She was the cool sister. And then in Camp Rock, I was like, damn, this girl's so cool. And then, you know, yeah, you watch that now. And now all the amazing things she's doing. I'm really excited for her. Well, let's talk about the amazing things you're doing as well. Well, thank you. How cool that you're now producing her. Thank you. Think about that. It is really cool. Did you think about that? No. Well, there you go. Whoa. Seek first to think about that and then think about the other. Mm. What? (laughs) (laughs) True, though. Yeah. I love that. Who would have thought that little girl in Seattle. Little Kelsey in Seattle. That little shit would be producing... Allison Stoner, the girl she thought was so cool. Mm -hmm. After she was told that she was too old to be on Disney Channel and that she would have to be a Disney Channel mom. Look at me now. Look at you now. Producing her. Who wanted to go crazy being on the Disney (laughs) Channel? No. I mean, you did. but I did. I really did. But I think you still are sad about it. (laughs) I actually, I think that I'm, I think I'm over it now. Mm? I really do. I really do. I think my parents are probably more sad at the money they put into the agency. <laughs> How much money did they put into what agency? What was that story? Uh, Tell us. Oh, they they were like all in because I really wanted it. So we did headshots. We did. I auditioned for this agency in Seattle. Like, were they scams? They weren't scams, but they just weren't good. Like my dad was like, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Why do I keep getting emails for like a 40 year old, like, like Asian male, like literally come on. Like he would get so mad. Those so. were the castings they were offering. You. Yes. yes. <laughs> and you're like, would, I'm a good actress, but I don't know if I can pull that one yeah, off. I don't know if I could do that. So anyways, yep. We, wow. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> crazy, but I'm okay. I'm good. Listen, I'm good. there's no shame in still having that feeling because I know it took yeah. me years to get past, like, you know, having one of my dreams crushed in my face. Yeah. True. Yeah. True. You're All right. because somebody didn't like somebody that hired me. Oh, oh my God. Perfect. Thanks, perfect. guys. People are So cute. your male egos just literally crushed my dream. Love that. It's I feel okay. like that's often a thing. Male yeah, ego you know, crushes a lot. <laughs> but what I realized after and maybe you will too, is if that dream had come true, A, I don't think I was really ready for it. I Mm. would have found my way, but I don't think I would have been really ready for it. And B, the negativity around that life and job actually wasn't worth my mental health. And I mean, I had enough people tear that apart too along the way, but, um, but I came out and I, I've survived. Um, but it wasn't really the right place for me because I still wouldn't be living up to my full capacity in that job. It was like a pinnacle kind of job where you're like, oh my God. And there would have been so much respect and yes, it's a great job, obviously, but I still have so much more than that. And you would have been held down by that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think, but it, it took a lot of distance for me to be able to look back and say, ah, oh, that was God's protection. Right. Right. That's you a know? good point. No, because I do, I do really believe, even though when, it, even when it's hard that everything happens for a reason mm-hmm. and timing's everything. And no, I think you're right. I think what I'm doing now which is at the end of the day, I want to help people. I think I'm helping people doing what I'm doing now. With your gift of being that bright sunshine, that person that's going to explode off the screen. um, A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. No, I think that a lot of us need to hear that, right? I think we get stuck in these things and not that I even was like consciously stuck, but you're right. I think a lot of us hold on to even a little bit. Yeah. And what could have been? Right. Oh my God, if right. I had gone that way, I would have been rich and famous and successful and all those things. And it's like, maybe God loved me just a little bit more than I thought because everybody has different tolerance levels, right? Like think of the things that you had to deal with that could have been exacerbated in that scenario. So true. Right. And think of maybe you wouldn't have been able to handle it and it would have been a, like a, a really bad scenario, right? Right, right. So I always say like God gives us what we can handle. We hear that all the time, but it really is true. And so certain things maybe we weren't cut out for 
to handle. And we just don't understand it because we didn't get in there to know. But if we went in that closet, like, and went in deep, it would have been like, what? Uh-huh. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think um, they are, rejection is God's protection. And so Amen, I'm I agree. really grateful because here we get to call our own shots. That's right. right? Mm-hmm. It's call our own shots. We get to do what we really feel is moving and powerful right. and helpful and positive, and we get to have fun doing it. So it's the best part. Yeah. And guess what? You have a legion of fans. Legion of fans. <laughs> right? Everybody okay. loves Kelsey. Thanks, guys. So um, so you got all your fans, and I bet Allison would probably tell you too, what protection. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I'm sure right? she would. Oh, yeah. But then there are the people, I think, that are meant to go through it to turn it into something. And I think that's what Allison's doing, right? She went through it. She came out the other side, and she's figuring out how to give now um, and be of service. And so I think, you know, obviously we all go through our different things in life. Um, so uh, do you want to give any updates on your 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 progress on your... My tum? Your SIBO stuff? Yeah. Are you sure you're doing that on regular guy Friday? We are. We okay. are. Okay. Yeah. No, but I mean, it's it's been great. It's like so incredibly empowering that, and I learned this from you, Maria, honestly, is like, I have to be my own biggest advocate. I have to be my own wealth of knowledge, right? So I really, when I really decided to ignore the outer and like kind of trust myself and dive in and do the research, that's when I found the right people to help me. Mm-hmm. And now I've been on this like SIBO diet per se and program for like the last 40 days. And it's the first step of a couple things, but I feel like already massively better. I mm-hmm. mean, it was like one week down and I felt massively better and it's empowering. Like it's not the easiest thing to stick to this diet, but Maria's like, how are you doing? And I'm like, fine, because I feel great. Mm-hmm. So it makes me want to keep going. And I think yeah. that's so cool, but it all starts with you, you know, grabbing the bull by the horns and being like, no, I'm going to be, I'm going to steer my own ship and I'm going to make my own calls. And I think that that's like the most like important thing ever. Yeah. So thank you well, for teaching me that. You're welcome. And if you weren't, if you were a Disney star and you weren't on Better Together, <laughs> would you have had access to all of these people? No. And honestly, it probably would have been worse. Right. So, so now, because Gabby Bernstein is the one who got you yeah. to the right person. Mm-hmm. Right. To finally get this under control. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. And I saw your stomach this morning. I'm like, whoa, it's noticeably down. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the basketball's deflating. Ugh, uh-huh. and the I SIBO just, basketball. Truly. And I have more energy. It's like, yeah, we're getting there. So there we go. Full Massive circle progress. again. Disney star Kelsey. Yeah. <laughs> could have been great for the ego. And that's where we have to really think is like, is this just for my ego? Of course it was for my ego to get the biggest job. Right. Because that's what we're trained for. But is that really what you want? Is that really where your gifts lie? Is that really you giving your everything? No. And now, same thing here. If you weren't here, you wouldn't know Gabby Bernstein personally. You wouldn't be able to just say, hey, can you help me? Right? And get you to the right people. Pooja would still be drinking three coffees a day. (laughs) She's smiling in the corner over here. I have to say, I think about it very often. I'm very proud of Pooja. I know. How like quickly she's absorbing and making changes. Truly. Because it's not easy, especially when you're young. You're like, oh, shut up, bitch. Like, I'm fine. I can do this. I'm good. I'm good. I mean, she's the one pushing (laughs) Yoga Nidra on me. And I love it. Are you still doing it? Oh my God, I did it last night. Yeah. I love it. It's the best. It's so good. So good. It's Kelsey, so easy. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. I it know. really is just so easy to do that it's like silly not to do it. I actually, when I was in the hospital with my uncle, I was trying to get, um, I was like, maybe we should do some yoga nidra with him. And then I realized oh, he just needs pure sleep right now. I think that even any energy to think was too much. Um, so I just did like the warm compress on his eyes. By the way, if you ever have somebody in the hospital and they can't sleep, like just wet a little towel with hot water, squeeze it out and then put it on their eyes and then just rub their head in a stroking motion, like in a pattern that's just, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, so that it's meditative. Whew, he went out like a light. And so. healing hands and good energy around you, you know. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. So anyhow, well, without further ado, at six years old, 
Allison Stoner began performing in television series, films, and music videos, starting from her now iconic appearance in Missy Elliott's Work It video, which we just talked about, to roles in Disney projects like Cheaper by the Dozen, Camp Rock, and the Step Up franchise. She has become a mainstay in the entertainment scene. Behind the scenes, though, she accumulated a variety of health conditions that affected every area of her life. Her personal healing journey now led her to her truest passion, studying the mind-body connection and creating tools alongside experts that help heal and empower, help people heal and empower themselves. Allison, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's so wonderful to speak with you. I think we have a an intersection of friends and mutual peers. So it's really nice to speak with you directly. Oh, I'm so excited. I I was saying the same thing kind of earlier, but not about the peers. It was like, we kind of have a similar experience where, you know, we were in the kind of tornado of Hollywood, not having a second to be in our own bodies. And then you know, life just kind of throws that last right hook to the face and you're just like, oh, okay, I I, I got to make some changes. And oh, and then you go on this like whole self-discovery path and, you know, healing path. And so I'm really excited for you to share your story with everybody and kind of what you learned along the way. So maybe we just kind of start with where, what was kind of, tell us a little bit about your journey as a child star And then what was that inciting incident for you to make changes? Sure. Well, first and foremost, when you talk about a subject matter like child stardom, it is inherently difficult to relate to. (laughs) It is set up with a lot of layers of, huh? And what? And that makes no sense. For one, the idea of a three-year-old having adult work hours, um, you immediately jump to questioning the parents or the producers, and you try to make sense of something that literally seems just nonsensical. And then you have other layers where the outward experience is the audience seeing this illusion of glamour and of happiness and success. And we're being, you know, sold a story about what matters. And then internally, there's this really opposite subjective experience for the child. Sometimes it's truly wonderful. Sometimes the stress really does catch up to you. The most important thing about my journey that I've learned is when you enter something like the industry or you know entertainment specifically there are so few tools and resources available that prepare you for what's to come so you jump onto this hamster wheel of auditioning and perhaps experiencing a big break and there's excitement there are a lot of ups and downs yes there's rejection but there's also incredible opportunities to do things that are, you know, once in a lifetime experiences, but at the level of the nervous system and your mental health and your sense of self identity worth, there aren't a lot of resources to prepare you for maneuvering through these different scenarios. And so it's just coming at you a mile a minute. And usually, like you said, There's stuff that's whispering inside your body going, hey, maybe you should slow down, but not a lot of chances to listen to it until it starts screaming at you and you find yourself, you know, in rehab from exhaustion or physically injured because you've, you know, exhausted your muscles from dancing for 15 hours a day. So a lot of my journey has to do with this outward experience of really really privileged and fortunate and beautiful success and also a lack of understanding how to manage what my body was dealing with uh, amidst that journey. Um, So for me, one of the inciting incidents, um, (laughs) there were many, but one was that I developed an eating disorder And logically, I knew that that made no sense. I knew that I didn't want to obsess over food intake or count every morsel of food that went into my body. And yet there was some kind of deeper urge or impulse to 
have a sense of control or have something to obsess over. And I would fixate on it and wonder why I was fixating on it. It was as if I was stuck in a pattern and I couldn't get out of it of my own own will and strength. So eventually after my skin was, you know, turning a different color and I was losing hair and I was 30 pounds medically underweight, I, and unfortunately not the thinnest person on set. So comparatively speaking, a lot of people were like, you don't have an issue. Everyone's this small. <laughs> horrible. Um, yeah, horrible. I ended up saying, you know what? I really need to get help. I don't want this to rule my life forever. I, I want to be a whole person and I can't seem to get out of this rep myself. How old were you? I was, I chose to go in before I turned 18 because wow. I learned through a lot of other people that if you go get treatment as an adult, people have been dealing with issues for longer periods of time. The environment can be a little bit, you know, heavier. Whereas, you know, younger people are, there's still that sense of hope. Your brain is developing. You, you have a little bit more of a gap and some space to really do some deep inner work and, and establish different patterns. So I went in before I turned 18 and what I thought was just treating an eating disorder honestly ended up helping me deconstruct my identity. Um, you know, a lot of different forces that shaped me, faith, sexuality, health, um, education, all of this stuff came to the forefront. And I had to ask myself a lot of questions. It was a really, really difficult dark night of the soul that lasted many years. Um, but it's so, 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 so worth it because here I am in a very different experience of mind and body and being, and, you know, now able to create resources for other people. So at 17, you had to deal with figuring all that out. That sounds like a lot after you're probably already burnt out too. Were you burnt out? Um, so sadly, in order to know that I was burned out, I would have had to have had some connection to my body. Mm. And I was actually in a state of pretty chronic dissociation and due to a, a number of reasons in the industry and also personal life, family, upbringing, et cetera. Um, I was diagnosed with a condition called alexithymia, which is the inability to name emotions or sensations happening in your body. So was I burned out? Probably. But could I feel it? Not necessarily, which kept me in machine mode. Because wow. I was very, very disconnected from the actual illnesses. You know, I had chronic sinus infections. I had all of these different red flags. And yet I had no other idea of what normal might look like. So it was like, okay, well, you just keep going. This is what I know. This is what I do. So yes, probably severely burned out burned my adrenal glands, you know, adrenal fatigue, all of it. And yet I was just kind of a hollow shell still, still going and smiling on the outside. Yeah. Well, we're all trained as, as girls to just keep smiling anyway, <laughs> right? We're supposed to smile through it all and be nice girls and uh, be good girls. Yes. So at that point, did you, when did you make decisions about your acting career? I had been contemplating leaving the industry and or taking a break for many years. And for me, it was almost a challenge to myself, an invitation to dare to believe that I had worth outside of the industry. Mm -hmm. And so I could have just kept going. And many people do, and that's okay. For me, I felt that if I didn't take some kind of dramatic step away from the industry, I'd always have its hooks in me as defining who I am, what I'm worth, and what I'm good at, and what I can contribute to the world. 
So I wrestled with that for years and years and years. When I started noticing that social media and digital media were entering the landscape, one, you see young you know, influencers who didn't necessarily train in a particular craft making you know, 10x <laughs> what you're making on, as a series regular on a TV show and you've been training your whole life and you're like, hmm, this math is not computing. Yeah. What do I want to do with this? And then two, you also see this beautiful opening of having direct conversations with your audience And having a community that shares values and that you can communicate important messages to and cutting out the middleman of said network or show or playing a character you hope inspires someone to think about something. And so I just was stewing on that. And I thought, hmm, maybe I'll start making my own content. It's a chance for me to reclaim my voice a bit and to share things that I'm truly passionate about. Because a lot of people mistake the characters I play for the totality of who I am as a human being. We can't do that, you know, to anyone in our lives. We have, we contain multitudes. We have so many layers, so many skills, some tapped into, some untapped. And so I thought, hmm, this is sort of a transition point. And my health was suffering as well. So it all kind of mixed together into this deeper choice to say, I'm going to dare to just step aside and deal with the fear of losing momentum and the fear of becoming irrelevant and Mm -hmm. the fear of not being employed ever again and just see what else is possible. So there's a lot of mystery to it, but wow, am I so glad that for my path, I chose that. And it's different for everyone, of course. Yeah. So what have the positives been? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Uh, For one, I can take a deep breath. Uh, Two, I am deeply connected to my body in a way that allows me to understand basic cues, hunger, fullness, tightness and tension versus relaxation, knowing how to stabilize myself in in everyday life and manage whatever the day brings instead of being constantly locked up and tight or disconnected or in a honestly a state of a traumatic response like a threat response and also I've now gotten to enjoy creativity and art because it's not solely tied to commercialization I'm not just an industrious machine used as a product to promote someone else's message of the world. I'm able to generate my own thoughts and share them with people. So there's a sense of autonomy and agency in my life. And it it's holistic, right? It's it's the the benefits are social for me. I ha- I can now build authentic friendships with people because I'm no longer only being used as social capital to elevate someone else in their, you know, whatever their pursuit is. I'm able to build trust deeply, deep intimacy with people because I'm okay with being seen as my full human self and not just protecting a reputation and persona. Culturally, Mm -hmm. there are shifts in my life. I mean, it, it's, it's so outrageously beautiful and meaningful that it it causes me to want to scream from the top of my lungs, you know, on top of a building. Normal life is so much better than fame and industry life. If I could, you know, like the mundane day to day, I'm just walking to the fridge and grabbing something to drink is so phenomenally like better than uh, you know, than the, than the concocted world that I, I had lived in previously. Wow. If that isn't the quote, <laughs> normal life is so much better than famous life, basically. Um, so did you have an inner knowing at some point that you didn't need the fame, that that didn't define you? Or did you discover that after you walked away? 
No, 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 no. <laughs> Philosophically and spiritually, I was totally aware of the illusion of fame because I also studied it from a you know sociopolitical, sociocultural standpoint to see what is the nature of fame and its impact on society. How does that tie into how the economy and how products get sold to people, and how we like keep everyone enthusiastic about being hyper productive because we're in competition with each other and we're in comparison culture and blah 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 like so I had studied it and I had been exposed to you know wisdom teachers mentors who would speak about life from a much deeper standpoint it was the fear of letting go of what was familiar mm -hmm. that kept me involved as long as I was and of course I still am. I come from a very different, you know, standpoint now and it'll continue evolving, but I was definitely aware that there was something else that could be my experience of reality. It was then, okay, now I have to look at all of the stuff that tethers me to this current lifestyle. Some of it's purely logistics. You're like, okay, I want to make a big change in my life. Yet, this is what, what, where I get paid. So I'm going to have to find a different job. Um, you know, this is the skill set that I have. So I'm going to have to either go back to school or teach myself some new tricks. Like some of it's just. Yeah. So time. what was that process like? How did you, how did you transition and say, okay, I'm going from making a ton of money. Right. And listen, we don't need to know what you made, but you were on massive projects and whether you were paid comparably to other cast members or not in the real world, you were making a ton of money. So to leave that behind and then have no kind of like, like a start over, how did that happen? What did you do there? What, what happened in between there? Cause this is by the way, you don't have to be a child star to be interested right. in this, you, there are so many people who are stuck in a job they never wanted, or they wanted it, then they got it. Now they don't want it anymore, but they're terrified of that moment from here to there. How do I get from mm -hmm. walking away from this high paying job as a, a DA, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever, and go into my passion? That's the fear is in there. So walk us through how you, how you kind of navigated going from one to the other. That's a great question. One thing that immediately comes to mind is that I had to accept that I wasn't going to be able to see the full vision in order to take the first step. I wasn't going to be able to understand who I would become and how I would make different decisions 10 years from now. I only could work with what I knew and I had to believe that I knew enough to take the next step. So I also had to invite flexibility in that vision of the future and say, okay, I'm going to take my best guess at where I might want to go or what might be healing and healthy and positive. But next month, as I gather new clues, I might paint a slightly different picture. So it required as someone who is both, you know, perfectionistic and wants to do everything right the first time, as well as rigid in, you know, very black and white either or thinking, I really had to invite the paradigm of both and. Okay, mm. this is going to be both scary and worth it. This is going to be both really obvious and kind of mysterious. And I'm going to be both confident in some ways and really uncomfortable in other ways. And it's going to have to, it's going to have to be a fluid process. And I'm not really going to have that comfort of being able to rest on a solid foundation. But I have to remember that the solid foundation I'm on right now is not actually that solid or it's not the building that I really want to be inhabiting. So yeah, when you're in construction mode, deconstruction and reconstruction, you're actually building a new framework, mm -hmm. a new frame for a new 
new life. And that's going to just happen one beam at a time. So, you know, that's, that's a part of it. And then another part of the process was I had to really start from square one in terms of time and energy management. When I looked at my desire to get somewhere else, I can dream all day long about having a different life. But if I don't know how to translate that into practical steps that fit into my existing schedule, then, you know, when will that change occur? So for me, my schedule was loaded with, you know, 13 to 15 stops every day. That was my norm. Driving around the city of Los Angeles, whether it's an audition, it's a meeting, it's a job, whatever it is, about 15 stops a day. And if I needed to make a change in my life, that meant I'm going to have to somehow get that down to 12 stops and then 10. And I'm going to have to create pockets of time where I can even read about how to start a different life. I'm, right now I'm exhausted when I get home, so I don't even read about how to start a new life, let alone try it. So I think really taking a look at my flow of my day and going, huh, I have to create space first. I have to make room. I'm going to have to clear out some stuff, whether that's letting go of certain friendships even, or uh, setting aside a job that might pay the bills more comfortably, but it's going to take up a lot of energy. Like I'm going to have to clear space in order to make room for something new. So I'll, I'll pause there. You know, it's, it's having the flexibility uh, in vision as well as practically creating room. I love that. Okay. I want to hear more. I want to hear more because I think this is the biggest thing for people is like, how do we make that leap? And it sounds like you did it in a methodical way, which is cool. Super um, methodical. <laughs> and I love, I love the flexibility thing. And I love that both can exist. Like you can be terrified and excited and it could be great one day and horrible shit the next day. Like that's just how it is when you're rebuilding. Because if anybody's been in construction and my husband's on the East coast right now working on our house, it's like, you make five great decisions and then you make one shit decision. And now the tub isn't going to fit and you got to get a new tub or you got to break the wall, make it bigger so that it'll fit in the tub, which is the one you're going to do. Cost analysis has to come in. What makes most sense? Everything isn't going to go perfect, you know, when you're rebuilding. So that, well, that immediately brings us to the importance of inner resilience and self-management tools. Because in this process, if you are applying yourself toward these changes, but your mental self-tape is hypercritical, negative, you're adding more barriers to that transformation, right? So you not only have to be trying new things, you've got to be an advocate for yourself. You have to be an ally to your mind and body. And if that looks like doing affirmations in the morning or listening to super inspirational speakers fill you up or, you know, reading a certain, you know, prayer or mantra, like you're going to have to support yourself while you're learning these new skills. And that means if you're going to be in uncomfortable situations, your nervous system is going to get activated more frequently in a state of arousal, whether that's stress or a sense of threat because something is unfamiliar territory or you're afraid of failure, whatever these barriers are that come up, a part of this transformation is learning to work with your body to say, hey, I'm listening to you and I understand that this is new and this is uncomfortable and we don't have to do it all right now, but can we learn how to work together here? And maybe take one step in this direction. And after you do this, I'll make sure we make some time later tonight to really relax and integrate so that you're not just constantly setting yourself up for chasing a new lifestyle and you never have a chance to process it and become the new self, right? I might be able to change the out, outward vision of my life, but if I'm still carrying my patterns, 
and ways of being from my first life cycle, Mm -hmm. I'm going to remain just as anxious and stressed. So there really is a process here of working with yourself and being an advocate for your own well-being and learning what you need in a particular moment to say, okay, I look forward to this process of transformation, not I want to shrink away from this because it is so terrifying and uncomfortable. I can't imagine dealing with that again tomorrow. Mm. So if we're looking at a diagram, right? Mm -hmm. Because the first thing everyone thinks about is never their health. They think about their finances. How am I going to survive is never about their health. (laughs) It's always about money, right? Because that's how the world looks at everything. So if I'm looking at a diagram, did you have like, you're here, you're here, then you got up here. Was there like a, an adjustment period for you where you had to really sacrifice to be able to follow this new pursuit? Yes. There are also layers to my personal financial story and history where I contractually was making a certain amount of money, but I personally never saw it. <laughs> oh, you have one of those. Yeah. Or I didn't know that I made that money. Oh, um, and we never hear also, these stories, Allison. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm really and, sorry to hear that happen to you. Well, and what's interesting is I adopted quite a scarcity mindset and I wouldn't really spend any, any money on anything. I mean, I am minimal kind of philosophically. I do prefer just get what's essential and that's, that's enough. I just feel peace and clarity and, you know, whole that way. But there were also some survival parts of that where I, I was afraid that Mm -hmm. I wasn't making enough money ever. Um, and I have my, you know, my own memories and, and experiences with why that was the case. But, um, all that to say, I do remember there was a period of time where I knew that I was no longer going to have, you know, film and television um, as a source of income. So I thought, what else can I do with what I know? And I created these workshops and I went almost like door to door to different acting schools. And I said, you know, a lot of your young actors are not getting hired because now people are obsessing over how many followers you know, people have in order, like as a facet of whether you're going to be hired or not. So I said, okay, I know a little bit about digital media. I know a lot more about film. What if I go door to door and pitch a workshop teaching young actors how to establish their social media presence to help them get hired so that they don't feel replaced by, you know, a certain kid who maybe has a lot of views, but not necessarily the passion and drive to dive into the craft of acting. And so, yes, it was a massive pay cut, but it was, it got me through that month. And I am not someone who cares about a luxurious lifestyle. So it wasn't challenging for me to, you know, only focus on gas money and groceries and, you know, the basics. That's kind of already how I live. Um, So I get that for other people. It might be like, more of a startling shift. Mm -hmm. Um, But there were for sure months and still are. I started my own company and we're self-funded, you know? So like, yes, I am completely, you know, evolving financially right now. Um, But I chose to accept that and to trust that uh, there will be a way and totally understand that I have a lot of different privileges and status and options (laughs) available that others may not. Um, but yes, by no means was it like, I'm just coasting and I feel completely free to explore and experiment for the next five years. And let's see where we land. It was like, all right. So this month, yeah, how many workshops do I need to teach? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's great though, because, and, and I don't know what the story is. So that's why I asked, but now again, someone listening to this is going to see that they are you and you are them, right? Everybody's got to, if you're going to start over, you're going to have to deal with sacrifices, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a lawyer and you hate what you're doing, you're going to have to go figure out another way. 
and that way may not have the same lifestyle attached to it for now. Mm -hmm. But I I think the thing that's special about you is I think that, well, there's a lot of special about you, but one of the things that um, I'm trying to verbalize is that you aren't afraid or you are, we're all afraid. We just kind of, they're the people who who put it aside and keep going anyway. And you're one of those people. So you're like, you're putting aside, you're going to keep going anyway. And you're, I think you have like a curiosity matched with like, um, like this eagerness to learn and grow that carried you through. So you're like, okay, we're going to get to the other side. There is something on the other side of this. And I, I see so much in you just talking to you. You're so well-spoken. You're so knowledgeable about everything that you're talking about that everything you're pursuing and self-funding right now is going to be incredible. I appreciate that. I do want to speak to, it's interesting that you, perceive me as being one of the, I'll, these are my words, not yours, but brave enough to, you know, move even amidst fear. Mm-hmm. I really, I, I did not see myself as that person growing up. I wanted so badly to be bold and audacious and I wanted to be dynamic. And so I will, I, it's beautiful to hear that reflected back and to know, oh, I actually have made strides. I'm not who I was. Mm -hmm. I started in many ways, very meek and quiet. And now having a different confidence in how I use my voice. And yes, some of it is, you know, competence built over time. Some of it is, um, you know, changing my self-concept. Um, but it's really beautiful. So I just want to name that in case someone's listening and they're going, oh, she was just born that way. I really don't feel, I don't identify with that boldness from my earlier years. I felt quite small and silenced. And um, and that, like I was just, I lived to appease whoever was in front of me. And I was a chameleon and whatever someone needed, I would accommodate and adapt. And, you know, now I'm like, oh, there's a, there's actually an anchored sense of self and, um, and I have my own voice. So it's, it's beautiful to hear that and to just reflect on, on the arc there. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely soak that in because I don't, as my husband says, Maria doesn't throw bouquets. I don't throw bouquets. She does not. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, Nor do I, so I appreciate that. Yeah. So so your relationships, how did they change when you shifted out of acting and into this space? Wow. <laughs> oh, I mean, it, there, in so many ways, um, first, I lost some friends, mm-hmm. right? Um, we simply no longer shared similar interests and aims. Um, also, the way we perceive each other, you know, it's like, Huh. Some people saw me walking away from Hollywood as, um, you know, uh, an act like that I had failed, that I had um, given up and I was no longer trying. And I knew for myself that it was coming from a very different standpoint, but I couldn't control their perception of me. So um, I had to kind of stomach that need to try and you know prove and explain to people no 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 no, that's not it that's not this is different I promise I promise and I just had to like swallow that and go huh yeah I'm not going to be able to explain my heart and mind to every person nor do they need to know it I am choosing a new path okay and what was exciting was it actually there was this one moment where I had a music video that was premiering that week Simultaneously, a friend reached out and told me about this Arctic trip happening where a hundred, you know, thought leaders, experts across sectors and generations would be gathered to explore the world's most pressing issues and the wisest questions we need to be asking in order to find new solutions Ooh. for the problem. And he said, you should come. And I was like, oh, you do you know Prince E? Uh, oh, Yeah. yeah. So, I love him. I just met I him. Like, yeah, I was like, 
I, I know him as Richard. I'm like, Richard, I really feel compelled to be there in like a deep way. But I have a premiere with a huge outlet. And this is what I've been aiming for with my music career, original music premiering, blah, 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 blah. And I knew that moment was a line in the sand for me because I set up my team to carry out the premiere and I found my way on the last ticket available within a 24 hour period, had to make all these decisions, get myself on a plane to get somewhere, to dock off on a ship, to go to the Arctic (laughs) with this group of people And I wasn't invited as a thought leader. I volunteered myself pretty much as like, I'll be, I'll clean the toilets is what I said to the founder. I was like, (laughs) I I just want to be there and I will use my platform to promote whatever these people are up to. She agreed graciously. And that was my first foray into this world of social impact and people who were aligned in a sense of purpose and, you know, the products they were creating and and everything. And so for me, I was like, whoa, I actually am, I'm, I'm surrounded by people who I feel see me and understand me, not just me as an actress. I didn't even know these people existed. So I share that all to say, it was, it was sad to let go of some relationships, but almost immediately when I started accepting myself and allowing more honest qualities to come forward, I did start encountering new people who were in different fields, but really resonated on a much deeper level. Mm-hmm. And, you know, many of the people on that trip are still friends to this day. We're now collaborating on projects internationally to, you know, make as, as positive of an impact as we can. I love it. I've had the same stuff, but, you know, friends, I think, you know, there are definitely the friends that you're going to outgrow and you won't be on the same page with. Sometimes I say like, I, I relegate them to like cousin status. I love you. We had amazing experiences together you know, I'll always remember the good times, but you're like my cousin that I'll see maybe once a year, or like every couple of years at a holiday party or something like no hard feelings, but we're just not on the same page anymore. Right. right. But like family yeah. can be the most challenging when you're making changes. Right. Yeah. Did you find that? Well, too? Right. Yes. I mean, of course. And we glue each other to our roles you know? And I just think even, I won't go super into detail on my family dynamics, but you know, there, there is um, addiction and abuse in, in our household uh, growing up. And there were dynamics that were created where sometimes the kids were the parents or um, the kids were kind of rescuing uh, a parent when they were kind of in a state of victimization or they were so fragile, they didn't know how to support themselves, whatever that was. And I remember, you know, thankfully I had access to therapy and a wonderful therapist. I remember us talking about it and realizing at some point, I'm going to have to outgrow this codependent relationship and this, you know, triangle, this dysfunctional (laughs) triangle of, you know, rescuer, victim, and I forget what the third role is. And I'm going to have to see myself differently first. And then the other people are going to have to like, either deal with it or respond to it or figure out a new role for themselves. Mm. So you're dismantling the norm. And, you know, we hear about that when people talk about breaking kind of generational trauma patterns or, you know, being sort of the healer within their family. Um, it's, it's awkward and it can be tense and we have to understand everyone's naturally going to have their own reaction to it and process around it. So just as you're changing, you gotta let them go through their cycles as well. And my main intention is even if this looks different, how can I still just place love at the center of it or wholeness at the center of it? So good. And 
if nothing else, at least that's a guiding force in how I choose to show up right now. Because yeah, the dynamic, who knows what it'll look like five years from now. But if we've stayed committed to loving each other or me at least showing up as love here, hopefully <laughs> that's at least gotten us closer to a, a healthier, you know, situation. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. like, you just kind of gotta like keep the core main thing, the main thing. <laughs> I love that. That's such great advice because what I have seen is when you shift, they get confused and some of them will shift with you and you're like, Oh, right. Well, that was interesting. Sometimes they just, it just kind of happens, you know, or yeah. in other moments, you know, maybe it takes a little bit more time, but, um, but I really like that. Just remembering that love is at the core. And if you keep reminding everyone of that, eventually, hopefully everything kind of will shift into its rightful place. Yes. And then also very quickly, I know that some family dynamics, like you can, I'm not saying love means feeling good or it's romantic or everyone is super close. Sometimes love is, you know, fierce boundaries and it's, this is not okay. And I'm not going to be in touch with you until certain things change or whatever. Mm -hmm. So like love has many faces and expressions. Just want to clarify. I love that. Every family is going to come together in like this seamless way. Yeah. (laughs) So great. Um, Allison, I have to ask you about um, the project you're working on right now, which is Movement Genius, um, because Mm -hmm. this has been such a great conversation. And I feel like I could talk to you for like hours and hours. Um, and hopefully we'll have some time to do that at some point, but, um, but I don't want to miss talking about movement genius because it is your platform that you're building to help people, um, with mental and emotional health. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, the easiest way to put it is movement genius is like headspace for the body. So if you log on to headspace and you're learning how to meditate and, they help you understand your mind body connection. Uh, movement genius is just really bringing the body into that process more. So we use movement to help improve mental and emotional well being. We work with licensed somatic psychotherapists to design classes that could be, you know, for relaxation or for an energy boost or for stress relief. And it helps you reconnect with yourself holistically. So not just your mind, but also your body, your nervous system, what you're feeling, the sensations and inner experiences um, so that you can learn how to manage whatever's going on in your day. And you gain the benefit of that short-term you know, result of being able to say, okay, in just 10 minutes, I legitimately feel better mentally and physically and emotionally. Um, so. It's a, right now it's a website and you can sign up and, um, our members are wonderful. It is so beautiful to see them taking classes. We do live classes as well as we have about 75 different videos, um, on the platform right now. And they range from like three minutes to 45 minutes and you can do them seated, standing, lying down. And it really is not about, um, the typical fitness narrative. It's not about going and working out and trying to burn calories or push your body into a new form. It's very much come as you are, whatever mood, whatever energy, start there and have an experience in your body that helps you not only feel better, but does provide those health benefits. Um, So yeah, so we have, you know, our members and we are having a blast and it's been beautiful to witness how it not only helps them in that moment, but they end up saying like, Hey, this, I used this grounding tool before a huge meeting and I ended up getting a promotion after, or like I used this, you know, anxiety trick, um, with, before I went into a family event and I didn't end up, you know, blowing up on my mom and we had a great conversation and like, I love hearing that it's positively affecting the rest of their lives as well. So it's actually like tools as well. Cause I've done grounding exercises that I've been taught before meetings. And my husband is like, 
what you were really different in this meeting. And I'm like, Oh, you noticed, um, because it really is that big of a difference when you actually do some of this work. Um, I love that because we've been doing yoga Nidra here as a team. So it sounds like you probably have like a yoga Nidra type of thing in there that like will relax the body and help you connect and all of that. Yeah. We use, um, a lot of somatic principles. So that's a whole field of study around the mind body connection. And I could, you know, talk for hours on it, but most importantly, they are um, specific movements and techniques that clinically help you reduce stress, uh, manage anxiety, it can improve sleep, it can improve your mood. Um, And if nothing else, it really helps you come into the present moment and just have a much more enriching quality of life. Um, You're just more alert and aware and, um, you know, find yourself less triggered by things because you're in a more even state of being. Um, so it's, it's beautiful. And from, it was, it was my biggest transformation personally, what really made a difference. I had read all the self-help books. I had tried a lot of different things. It wasn't until I brought my body into healing and transformation that, my entire life truly transformed. Mm -hmm. I know I've been doing somatic work since February and I've been seeing such a massive difference too. Out of all the therapies I've done, somatic expression has been the most incredible. Yes. Yeah. And there are so many different modalities. Um, So we have a range of, you know, classes and some yes are more like skill-based if you want to just learn about the concept. Um, but a lot of them are just show up as you are and the instructor will guide you through the class. And, you know, there's a reflection point at the end often and um, you have to check it out. We, I'm going to, say, I can't yeah, wait actually. Um, you all up a cool deal. It's called movement genius. And what's the website? Movementgenius.com. Easy breezy. Um, also, Allison wrote a book, Mind Body Pride. It's the seven step guide for deeper interconnection. Um, so, we will put all of this in the description of this episode. Um, also, she has an affirmation album, allisonstoner.com backslash affirmations. And you can find her on Instagram at Allison Stoner at Movement Genius. Again, I'm going to put all of this. Not me, actually, Kelsey. Yes, I will. put everything in the summary of this episode. And also, Maria, I'm pretty sure Allison and team have a cool little little, uh, thing for our audience. Oh, Mm -hmm. tell, tell. We do, yeah. So I'm going to have the new version of my book, uh, Mind Body Movement. So Mind Body Pride was specifically for queer folks and is still available. Um, But the version for all bodies, all minds, all folks um, is going to be available. And I wanted to offer your community, um, not only a copy of the book for, you know, 1299, but add in a month free on movement genius. And you can go through the book and there's even a video course that accompanies it. So you can try the techniques in real time with what you're reading. Um, but if you're like, Ooh, I want to know even more, or I want to try even more classes, you'll have 30 days complimentary of being able to be a movement genius member. And, um, you know, I would just love for people to experience what it's like to reconnect with themselves and feel empowered to embody the person they really want to be, to not just have that as an idea in the future, but to really take those steps and to have people supporting you and a community in it with you um, so that you experience that new life, um, in the present. So definitely check out the book and know that when you get the book, you're also a movement genius member and you can, uh, join us for our class. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I know everyone's going to be excited about that. So Kelsey, how do they activate this little gift Allison has? Oh, I'm going to work with Allison and her team. And Allison, I feel like we could just throw it in our description in the YouTube video. Something they can link to. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So we'll get a little linky. We'll put it in the summary if you want to get the book and the um, the free class as well. So um, just click that for your um, amazing gift from Allison and uh, and her team. So Allison, you're a joy. Thank you for what you're doing. 
with your your findings, your experiences. Thank you so much. That was so good. So good. Wow. She's so well-spoken and so knowledgeable. Like she really has done the studying and the work. She's done the work. And I just love how she just keeps saying, and we're always evolving. Like she's not like, oh, I've mastered it all and all of that. And and I just loved her process, the way she processed everything, how she thought everything through, where it was like, okay, you know, it could be all of the things and it right. could keep changing every day. And I think I connected with that because my journey keeps changing and evolving and it isn't there yet. It's it's happening, which is cool. It is cool. I Even really, though it can be scary and it can be, oh yeah. you know... All the things. All the things. And I think it's the understanding that it can be that, right? And like giving your yourself a chance to, like she said, like relax and integrate, right? And like really absorb the stuff. And like, instead of just being fearful, it's like mm -hmm. give yourself a chance to sit quiet and like understand that, okay, yeah, this is happening right now. But what was her thing? This can be both this and this. Yeah. It can be both scary and amazing. It, you know, that's something that I really took from this episode that I'm going to apply. It, things can be both this and this. Yeah. I loved that. Yeah. Well, I, I think, um, it's, it's also really the direction that I would like to get into of like, I've really been in this process of like, I want to simplify. I want to shed too much stuff. Guys is too much stuff. Like I was in your room because that's where I had to sleep when I was back in Connecticut. <laughs> you say that. I'm like, you're in my room? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like thinking my room here. Oh, wait. P.S. <laughs> I borrowed your pajama bottoms. I love that. Um, I and I was telling everybody there. as a joke because I couldn't get into my closet. Oh, and hilarious. I didn't have any sweats. And we were going outside to do the bonfire. And Kevin goes, oh, Kelsey has a pair hanging in the closet. And I said, oh, okay. So then I go out to the bonfire. I go, nobody tell Kelsey I borrowed her <laughs> pants. She's going to be so pissed. And everyone's like kind of looking at me. They're I go, like, really? guys, I know Kelsey. If 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 Kelsey <laughs> was going to be bothered by me borrowing her pants, I trust me, I would have called her. Yeah. But I'm living in her room. She evacuated, but she left things behind because she had too much shit. I was going to say, I don't <laughs> even know what pants you're talking about. They so. were really cozy, like army green, fluffy, warm, yummy oh, pants. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like you have so Walmart much shit kind. that Kevin already boxed all your shit and put it aside because he couldn't fit his own stuff in there. <laughs> and there's still a lot of shit. Oh, I believe it. So I know you're Feel in the process <laughs> of simplifying, right? Because oh, you've been yeah. noticing it now and you weren't noticing it before, right? Oh. Because obviously we're kind of putting it in your head too. Yeah. Or making you aware of it. You need people around you that are going to make you aware of shit. Sometimes you really do. If you don't have people that are going to say, "Hey, wait a second. Like you're having 18 coffees. Maybe there's something wrong here. Like let's let's think about this for a second. It's not judgment. It's really like there is a better way to do this or at least be cognizant of it. And if you still want to then whatever. But I'm doing the same thing. Right. I'm simplifying because the more you have, the more you have, the more stress, the more burden, the, the more, more it weighs you down, whether yeah. you know it or not, stuff weighs you down. Like you look at her background of her shot. So simple. So clean. So yeah. simple. You look at her YouTube videos. She doesn't have a lot of stuff, right? It's you just to be able to fly, you have to have nothing holding you down. Yep. Amen. So, and I think too, just like when you're, you know, you need other people like I have Maria to come in, Maria and Kev to come in and like say this to me because when we're surrounded by our peers, we're all doing the same shit. Exactly. No one's going to say no. that's not normal to have a hot mess of a bedroom. Because it's normal for us. Because it's us. normal for them. Exactly. Yeah. So, no, I'm very grateful. I mean, every time, like, I have never made my bed in my whole life. Now I make my bed every freaking morning. Don't you feel good? So good. When you go home oh. and your bed is made. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. But and like now, I'll have Jeff Graham who's in here and he'll find the one expert who says that having a mess I is know. totally fine. <laughs> Jeff. And I'm like, Jeff, like I remember that. I mean his <laughs> the office was a fucking hot mess all day, every day. And I love him. But I'm like, Jeff, this is not conducive to success, to and not I mean money success, success in the money. In your brain, yeah. When your stuff is clean and simple. 
No, it feels so good. <laughs> like my room has never, ever been my like haven ever. I've never been that person who's like, I'm just going to go to my room because I never had a TV. Like I didn't really care. Now I go home and I literally go to my room, whether it's like I'm finishing work on my little meditation stool mm-hmm. or I'm just laying it like, yeah. So yeah. I'm very grateful. And that's why most of you want to get the fuck out, excuse my language, and you run out to chase away the madness that's in your home Ooh. because you don't want to be there. That's why you go out. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That was me. I always ran. I was always on the move. Oh, and yeah, you're totally right. So everybody remember that. Okay, so um, if you haven't joined us on Patreon, guys, uh, we're doing some really cool stuff over there. You want to click the link tree in my Instagram or Better Together's. Join us at the $10 tier. $10 a month. You get ad-free shows of ep- uh, everyday episodes. You get an extra episode a week, and you get the monthly heel events where we go deep and it's an incredible vibe. You will feel so good every month when you do these events with us, um, carefully curated for you. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already hit subscribe and follow us at Better Together with Maria. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices and be present.